All right. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Jennifer Dixon. And I'm going to be moderating for you. Uh, we're just kind of, I'm talking a little slow here right now, just to let folks come into the room. We got a few people trickling in and joining us. Wanted to let you know that we do have some people calling in as well. So um, we are going to make sure that we're addressing those if we have people that have questions later. And I'll, and I'll let you know how to ask those questions in a minute here. So um, my panelists, I do need you to turn your videos on. Or if you can turn your video on, I'm not sure if you can or not. Um, we're gonna go ahead and introduce you all in just a minute here. Um, and all right, let's see. So we're here to talk tonight about the, it's a PFAS community update. So the area we're gonna be focusing on is Detroit, Dearborn, and Melvindale. Um, we have a few kind of housekeeping things to go over before we get started with the actual meeting. So your lines are gonna be muted during our meeting. We are recording the meeting. So we will have an opportunity at the end and I'll kind of go over you know, how we're gonna handle the evening tonight. Um, at the end, we're, we will have an opportunity for you all to ask questions. You'll be able to either type questions in or to um, verbalize them. But just to let you know how kind of how the evening's going to run. So first, I want to welcome you. So welcome to the meeting tonight. We're going to introduce all the staff we have. We have a, a nice um, handful of, of staff from Eagle and from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services here to talk to you tonight. We're going to do an information session where you're going to hear from a couple different staff people to talk about some specifics around PFAS and some of the specific sites that we have in the area. We're gonna do that question and answer session. So as you're listening to the presentation, feel free to jot down any questions you have. As we're chatting, if you have one, you can feel free to type that in the question box. We're gonna talk a little bit about where to find more information and um, who to contact if you have more questions about what we talked about tonight. So first I wanna introduce everybody. So if you're watching on Zoom, you should be able to see almost everyone besides Art. Oh, there he is, good. Hey, nice to see you, Art. Um, so I'm just going to introduce everybody that we have on the line tonight. So the first person we have is Steve Sliver. He's our MPART Executive Director, and he's going to be listening to the question and answer today just to make sure that he can keep track of what else, what all is going on with these issues. Um, Regina Strong should be on. I'm not sure if she's on yet, but she should be on. Um, she's our Environmental Justice Public Advocate. You're going to primarily be hearing from Tracy Cascametti. She's our Materials Management Division District Supervisor. She's going to be giving most of the presentation tonight. And then Lisa Fisher, who is a toxicologist from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, is going to be giving most of the other part of our presentation tonight. We also have Joe Rogers. He's a geologist with Materials Management Division. We have Melinda Steffler. She's with our Water Resources Division. She's a district supervisor. We have Art Ostrzewski. Um, he's our drone flyer. That's what I usually associate him with, but he also works with our Materials Management Division. Um, we have Ann Tavalier. She's with our Water Resources Division. Ian Smith is with our Drinking Water and Environmental Health Division. We have Brandon Armstrong with Water Resources. He's a toxicologist there. And Joe DeGrazia, who works with our um, Resource Redevelopment Division um, as an incident management specialist. So we've got a lot of staff here. So hopefully, and I work with air quality. So if for some reason you happen to have an air quality question, um, we should have plenty of staff here to be able to uh, answer those questions. So Lisa and Tracy, if you guys wanna leave your cameras on. Oh, and I forgot to introduce one of the most important people here tonight, Les Smith, he's my co-host. So he's gonna be working with me behind the scenes. I always make him turn his camera on so I can introduce him to everybody. But if Tracy and Lisa wanna leave their cameras on and the rest of the panel can go ahead and turn theirs off for now. And we'll reintroduce you guys at the end. So a little bit of logistics, if you haven't done Zoom before with us, you're going to be using your question and answer box at, on your toolbar to type in any questions that you might have. Like I said, you can type those in at any time during the presentation today. If you really feel strongly about speaking your question aloud, we're more than happy to have you do that. You'll just click that hand icon on the bottom of your screen. So if you can hold those questions until the very end of the presentation, we'll try to get to you in the order your hands were raised, if at all possible. And since we do have some folks calling in on the phone, if you wanna raise your hand and ask a question verbally from the phone, you're just gonna go ahead and click on the star nine key on your phone. So with that, Tracy, I'm gonna go ahead and pass logistics over, or I'm done with the logistics, and I'm gonna pass the real portion over to you to go ahead and get started. All right. Give me just one second here to transition to my slides.
All right. Are, are you guys able to see my slides at this point? Okay. Thumbs up from Jen. Is the sound okay? All right. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about PFAS tonight. Again, my name is Tracy Cascometti. I work out of our Southeast Michigan District Office. Um, and one of my roles there is to work on issues that come across all of our divisions, whether that's our remediation program, our materials management programs, air quality, water quality. And so I'm going to be giving the sort of general overview tonight. That's not to say that I'm the project manager or the technical expert in any one of these issues, um, but I'm going to give the overview. Like Jen said, we have uh, many technical staff on the line to answer any of your questions. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of an outline here because we do have a lot of content to cover. It is not my intention to bore you all with PowerPoint, um, but there's so much to talk about with this issue. So we've sort of broken it up into, into some sections. I'm going to start with a real high level overview about PFAS, what I call PFAS 101, just so we're all starting from a, you know, the same point of understanding with this issue. And then I'm going to turn it over to Lisa, who's going to talk about PFAS and health. Uh, come back to me to talk about PFAS in our drinking water, and then back to Lisa for PFAS and fish, and then back to me to round it out. I'm going to talk about sources of PFAS in the community and, uh, and what we're doing to address those sources, and then again, open it up to Q&A at the end. So let's just start with uh, PFAS 101, just so we're all on the same page. So when we say PFAS, you know, which is P-F-A-S, talking about per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. And PFAS is a whole family of chemicals, right? So it's not one individual compound. When we say it as PFAS, that implies uh, the group of chemicals. And these are all man-made chemicals. Um, and these are some of the strongest bonds we have in chemistry, right? And so that has a lot to do with how these chemicals behave in the environment. These were sort of seen as uh, miracle chemicals of a sort, right? They brought to us a lot of really useful consumer products like nonstick pans and stain resistant carpets and you know, anything that was grease resistant, water resistant, um, you know, had PFAS in it. And this, these chemicals were used throughout all sorts of commercial applications. And so we have been using these products in our homes for decades now. And they're also industrial applications. I mean, they were used actually in industrial health and safety to protect workers from, uh, from exposure to, to other sorts of industrial chemicals. And maybe most importantly, PFAS was used in what we call AFFF or aqueous film forming foam, which is a firefighting foam, right? So this is the kind of foam they use to extinguish uh, you know, jet fuel fires, or plane crashes, or you know, any, any sort of hydrocarbon fire would be put out by uh, what we call AFFF. And, you know, a lot of the sites of PFAS contamination we see across the state are associated with the use of this, this firefighting foam. When we talk about PFAS, we generally measure it in the units of parts per trillion, which is also nanograms per liter, right? But, you know, think about that, that is one part of PFAS chemical in a trillion parts of water, right? So that's how we measure the concentrations of PFAS. So that's, that's some of the lingo you'll hear us use tonight. I try hard not to use acronyms, but I will not be saying per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. I will, I will say PFAS to talk about the whole family of chemicals and from time to time call out uh, individual PFAS compounds like PFOS, and I try to pronounce that PFOS. Right, that's, the, that's one of the compounds that, that generally drives a lot of our water quality work is PFOS. Um, and so that's just that's a little bit on the, on the lingo side. And you know, thinking about why we're concerned about PFAS, you know, why are we talking about PFAS so much in Michigan? You know, this is a widespread uh, contaminant in our environment. We find it in a lot of different kinds of environments. Um, but because of that, that bond we talked about, right, this really strong chemical bond, between the carbon and the fluorine in this chain, this long chain of chemical, it doesn't really break down very easily. So it doesn't biodegrade. So it sticks around in the environment for a long time and it can build up in our bodies or in fish tissues. And some of these PFAS chemicals may have health effects. And Lisa's gonna talk more about health. Um, but, but the other aspect of this is, you know, when we say we have a whole family of chemicals, I'm talking about thousands of PFAS compounds. And we don't have a complete 
uh, body of understanding on all of these compounds, right? And so we lack some toxicological information to set standards for these things. And in fact, there are uh, there's a lack of national standards. We don't have uh, guide, we have guidance from the federal government, but we don't have enforceable numbers, you know, under the Safe Drinking Water Act or under the Clean Water Act, so, or under our, our cleanup programs. And so we have sort of a patchwork across the country of what numbers we're using for, for cleanup standards and for drinking water standards. And Michigan has really been on the forefront of, of developing that science and setting those standards. So in Michigan, we have something called uh, what we call MPART, which is our Michigan PFAS Action Response Team. And this is really a communication structure to get all of our government agencies coordinating. So when we're addressing PFAS in Michigan, it is not just you know, the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. It's you know, EGLE combined with the Department of Health and Human Services, DHHS, but also DNR and the Department of Agriculture and MDOT and Military and Veterans Affairs and the licensing and regulatory affairs folks. And so really MPART is a structure to make sure we're pulling resources across all of those state agencies to get the best coordinated approach to address, to address this issue. Um, and when we think about our PFAS response, our very first priority is protecting public health. And so all of our actions are prioritized based on public health protection. Um, what you'll hear from Lisa when she talks about health is that our primary route of of concern with PFAS is, is ingestion, right? And so often when we talk about PFAS, our focus is on, is on drinking water. Um, MPART is doing a lot of things though. It's not just uh, sampling drinking water or dealing with contaminated sites. I mean, we're really trying to move the science and, and grow the science on PFAS and understand the ecological effects, how this stuff is moving through our environment, how are we going to treat it, how are we going to identify sources, preventing future contamination, so it's really a, a multi-pronged approach. And I'm gonna to touch on some of this stuff tonight. I mean, it would take you know, a week long seminar to go through all of this stuff. So what we're trying to do tonight is really boil this down to the issues that are of interest in uh, sort of you know, Detroit, Dearborn area, what I think of as the Lower Rouge watershed. Um, and then certainly we can take any questions on, on the rest of it that we didn't touch on. So at this point, I'll, I'd like to turn it over to Lisa. And I'm gonna advance the slides and Lisa's gonna do the talking. So bear with us while we make that transition. Lisa, are you ready to unmute? Yep, I am ready. Can you hear me? All right. Um, so yeah, I'm Lisa Fisher. Um, I'm a toxicologist with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, also known as DHHS. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what we know about health and PFAS. So like Tracy said, um, the main pathway of exposure for um, PFAS chemicals is um, through drinking contaminated water. Um, but there are other ways that people can be exposed to PFAS and that can include um, eating fish that are caught from water bodies that are contaminated by PFAS. Um, we do have some do not eat um, advisories across the state um, because of PFAS, but we also have um, less restrictive guidelines related to PFAS as well. Um, you can also be exposed to PFAS through incidental swallowing of contaminated dirt, so soil or dust. Um, like Tracy said, there's um, a lot of consumer products um, that contain PFAS, and so if you're eating food that was packaged in materials that contain PFAS, that's the way that you can um, accidentally or unknowingly ingest PFAS. Um, and then absorption of PFAS through the skin is typically not a concern. Um, there are some areas across the state um, where we have issued um, foam advisories. So that's like this white fluffy foam that you see on um, like lakes or rivers. Um, but typically PFAS absorption through the skin is, is not a concern. So this graph, um, shows blood levels of the most common PFAS in Americans from 2000 to 2014. And you can see there's a pretty um, steep decline in the levels of PFOS in people's blood between 2000 and 2004. And in 2002, um, the US um, stopped the production and use of PFOA and PFOS. And so we have seen um, a pretty dramatic decline in the levels of um, PFOS in people's blood 
um, from 2000 to 2014. Um, and to kind of um, make up for not having PFOS and PFOA in manufacturing in the United States, um, companies have replaced these with other um, lesser known PFAS chemicals that typically have shorter half-lives, but the science is still emerging on any associated health effects with those other PFAS compounds. And so there are some potential associated um, human health effects with um, exposure to PFAS. And um, what I have listed are some um, human health effects related to PFOA and or PFOS specifically. And these um, came from animal studies or epidemiological studies in humans um, that were exposed to very high levels of PFAS. And um, for those of you on the phone, I'm just going to read these quickly. Um, some of these um, potentially associated human health effects include lowering a woman's chance of getting pregnant, increasing the chance of high blood pressure in pregnant women, increasing the chance of thyroid disease, which is specific to PFOA, increased cholesterol levels, changes in immune response, and an increased chance of cancer, specifically kidney and testicular cancers. And then so EGLE does a lot of um, the site investigations for PFAS, but DHHS works with local public health to understand the concerns facing your community. So we let EGLE do um, you know, all of the sampling, uh, sampling design, and then we come in and support the local health department to um, lead the public health response actions and planning. And so our goal is to um, take the data that Eagle collects and evaluate PFAS exposure to residents in the community and determine if public health response actions need to be taken, such as providing alternate water. And I think that is my last slide about this. So I'll turn it back over to you, Tracy. All right, thanks Lisa for going through the health information. So what I'd like to do now is take a little bit of time to focus on uh, the pathway of drinking water exposure and, and talk about what we understand about drinking water in the, in the Metro Detroit area. So first, we sampled community water supplies across the state for PFAS. And this started with um, some smaller sampling efforts in 2017 and really ramped up in 2018 and 19. And even if we go um, farther back than that, in about 2013, US EPA had started looking for PFAS in community water supplies. But what's interesting at that time, uh, you know, like I mentioned before, our science has been evolving on this issue. And so back in 2013, our lab capabilities were not even really built up to be able to detect PFAS at the concentrations that we're concerned with. And so when EPA first looked at this in 2013, they didn't really identify um, you know, PFAS across these water systems. And so once the, when the science is getting a, you know, a bit more refined here, we've, we've repeated this sampling and taken a harder look at this. Um, and so what we did with our surface water plants, which is what we have here in Southeast Michigan, right, are water plants that draw from surface water bodies like lakes and rivers. We sampled these on a regular basis to try to assess, you know, the variability that we may see. Um, as the, you know, as the flows go past these intakes and any seasonal variability we might have. And so at a minimum, all these public water supplies were sampled um, monthly for six months in 2019, and that was statewide. And so I, I'm going to talk specifically about what we found here in Metro Detroit, but just for orientation, I want to spend a second um, just kind of highlighting how this system works. And so just for orientation, right, we're talking, this is the Detroit River. Can you guys see my pointer? I'm trying to use this laser pointer. Let's see. So Tracy, you actually clicked on the wrong thing. Go yeah, on the pen. There we go. There okay. you go. That All works. right. So for just for some reference, right here, we have Belle Isle up here. So this is right where Lake St. Clair is coming down into the Detroit River. Come down the Detroit River. Here's Zug Island where the Rouge comes out. We come up and we have Marathon Refinery. We have the Rouge Manufacturing Complex. You know, we come down here the city of Wyandotte, and this is Fighting Island. So that's just a little bit of orientation. Um, the Great Lakes Water Authority provides, you know, the majority of the public water in Metro Detroit, and they do that through three intake locations and five water treatment plants. 
So there's one intake location you can't see on this map because it's way up in Lake Huron. And that intake services a water plant that's up there and, and provides water mostly to the, the northern suburbs. Um, this, this location here, right on the upstream side of Belle Isle, the intakes in this area serve three water plants that provide water largely to the sort of upper, uh, upper area here, Detroit and Dearborn. And, and you know, in a larger service area as well, right? Into, into you know, Warren and Livonia and some of these other suburbs. But you know, for the area we're focused on, if you're thinking about Dearborn and Detroit, most of your water is coming out of this intake up here at Belle Isle. And then as we come down the river, uh, the Great Lakes Water Authority also has an intake out here. These are actually, this is actually Canadian waters. This, is, this island is called Fighting Island. There's an intake down here that services what we call the Southwest Water Treatment Plant. And Melvindale's water largely comes out of that, that system there, along with the downriver communities, with the exception of the city of Wyandotte, because they run their own water plant and they have an intake here right off of right off the city of Wyandotte. So that's just for orientation, you know, sort of how our, our regional system works. Um, but I think, you know, one thing to keep in mind here is that we're all using Great Lakes water, right? This is water from Lake Huron coming down through, through the channels. And, um, you know, these intakes are where they are located where they are intentionally, right? And studies have been done and assessments have been done as to the vulnerability of these intakes to pollution events. And there's, you know, constant monitoring of these drinking water intakes and the treated water that the plants produces. Um, and so what we find really is that these intakes are not particularly vulnerable to pollution events, which is different than, you know, if you had a water supply taking water in from, you know, a much smaller river system. So just to focus in a little bit, we're going to talk about um, the intakes up here at the top of Belle Isle. So again, these service three different water plants, Waterworks Park, Spring Wells, and the Northeast plant. These plants were all sampled for six months, uh, monthly for six months in 2019. And we saw very little in the way of PFAS detection. So in fact, the Great Lakes Water Authority Northeast plant, um, all of our results were non-detect for PFAS. Um, and I, I'm not sure why I chose to go bottom up, but just bear with me here. So then the other two plants, Waterworks Park and Spring Wells, we did get one detection in July of 2019 at three parts per trillion and then at Waterworks Park at two parts per trillion. Now that detection was not in the finished water coming out of the water plant. It was in what we call the raw water, right? The water they're pulling in from the river before treatment. And all of this sampling was done by state of Michigan contractors so that, you know, we had consistency across the state and how the sampling was done and how the data is being managed and so that we can, we can you know, sort of collate all of this data together. And all of this sampling was really, I'm gonna put this, all this sampling, um, you know, it was non-regulatory sampling because when this sampling was happening, we did not have enforceable standards under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, but now we do, and we'll talk about, I think we have a slide on that in a, couple of, in a couple of minutes here, but moving forward, the Great Lakes Water Authority will do monitoring that is required under rule, and we do have enforceable standards. So back to that Southwest intake, which is the one down here off of Fighting Island. Um, we saw really similar results, right? Almost, uh, we, we sampled this intake 13 times. We sampled it monthly for six months, and then we sampled it weekly for a period of time. And we had one detection, in, again, in July of 2019 at three parts per trillion, and everything else was non-detect. That intake obviously will be um, subject to monitoring under the new rule as well. Now, the Wyandotte drinking water plant, you know, they have this intake down here that services just the city of Wyandotte. We sampled that 15 times, again, monthly, like all the other surface water plants, and then weekly, because there was a detection in August of 2019 that was out of the ordinary, right? So in July, we saw two parts per trillion, just like we had seen at the other water plants. But then in August, we saw this 49 parts per trillion of PFOS, um, which is unusual in this area, and we hadn't seen uh, a result like that. And so in response to that, we started sampling this water supply weekly. And after that one detection, we, we never had another, another detection of PF, PFAS in that system. Um, and again, Wyandotte will be subject to Safe Drinking Water Act monitoring moving forward. 
So this chart summarizes the new standards. So I've alluded to this a little bit. Michigan has Michigan now has enforceable standards under the under our Safe Drinking Water Act program. Like I mentioned at the top of our presentation, there are not national standards under the Safe Drinking Water Act, and so Michigan has developed uh, what are called maximum contaminant levels. These are this is the standard we use in drinking water to say there can be no more than this amount of a contaminant in your finished drinking water. Um, you know, if, if your system is in compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. And then if, if uh, samples come back that exceed these values, it triggers different actions under the law, right? So these, these levels just took effect this past summer, August 3rd. Um, it applies to 2,700 water systems across the state of Michigan. And moving forward, what's going to happen is the, the water plants have to take a sample um, you know, and for Great Lakes Water Authority and Wyandotte, those samples are being collected sometime this fall. They have to take a sample and the results of that sample will determine how frequently they sample for PFAS moving forward, right? So we have a lot of data from the last year to know that we, we consistently have, uh, you know, non-detections or very low levels of detections across these systems. And if they collect a sample here this fall, if the result is non-detect, they will sample annually moving forward. And if they detect any of these PFAS compounds, they will sample quarterly moving forward until the time that we have you know, confidence in, their, you know, in the amount of sampling they've collected to show that we're back down to non-detect. Now, um, we've got Ian Smith on the line who can answer many more questions about this than I can. So if you have questions, save those for Ian at the end. And then there's a link here if you're interested in you know, detailed guidance on this new drinking water rule. All right, now I'm gonna turn this back over to Lisa to talk about fish. All right, yeah, so um, I just wanna talk about the MDHHS Fish Consumption Advisory Program, which we also call the Eat Safe Fish Program. And um, the goal of the Eat Safe Fish Program is to encourage the public to eat fish while also being aware of any health risks that may go along with eating fish from um, water bodies that are contaminated. Um, next slide. So to give a little bit of history, uh, the state of Michigan issued its first fish consumption advisory in 1970, and that was due to mercury. Uh, mercury is commonly found in um, fish across the state and is known to build up in fish tissues. And then um, since then, over the years, um, additional chemicals have been added um, to the, the fish consumption advisory program. And most recently in 2012, we started testing fish um, for PFAS, um, specifically 11 different PFAS. And of those 11 different PFAS, um, PFOS or PFOS is the main PFAS that shows up in fish tissue. Um, so that's the one that I'll be talking about tonight. So in a couple of slides, you'll hear me talk about the Michigan servings per month. And the Michigan servings per month is basically our guideline that we use to tell a person um, how often they should eat fish from a specific water body per month. And that is based on um, a person's body weight. And then on the right, I've also included um, the three C's. So the first um, of the three C's tells you how to choose um, fish that are gonna be lower in contaminants for you to eat, um, followed by how to clean and cook those fish to further reduce your exposure to contaminants. Next slide. We also have the statewide safe fish guidelines. And we use these if there's a um, specific water body that hasn't had fish tested from it yet, or if there's a specific fish species um, from a water body that has, has uh, we don't have data for. So that's what the statewide safe fish guidelines are used for. And um, we create these guidelines by, um, based on what we know about how chemicals build up in fish species specific to their size and um, where they are on the food chain. Next slide. So here's a little map of um, where fish collections have taken place um, for PFAS analysis. So back in 2016, um, it was, let's see, 
yellow perch and largemouth bass that were collected from the Trenton Channel and the Detroit River for PFAS analysis. And then um, this past October, let's see what species. Um, rock bass and yellow perch were collected from the Lower Rouge River, just downstream of the Ford Dam. And then um, you'll also see some red dots on this map. And the two red dots to the west represent where the Rouge Manufacturing Complex and the Marathon um, sites are. And then that red dot to the east is another MPART site which is the um, Gordie Howe Bridge. So here's a table of um, our current fish consumption um, guidelines for the Lower Rouge River. You can see we've tested different species for um, a variety of contaminants, including PCBs, mercury, PFOS, and DDT. So, um, and then what's, what's listed in the table are the Michigan servings per month based on the levels of these different contaminants that we saw in the different species. So you can see for rock bass, um, the, the, based on the PFOS levels, that would put them in a Michigan servings per month category of eight uh, servings per month. For yellow perch, it would be 12 servings per month. Um, but what you can see in these highlighted boxes is that we actually have more restrictive um, fish consumption guidelines based on PCBs and or mercury. Um, so while we have been testing fish in the Lower Rouge um, for PFOS and other PFAS, the PFOS results um, don't change the current fish consumption guidelines that we have in place for, for this part of the river. And it's really the PCBs and mercury that are driving um, the fish consumption guidelines. Next slide. And we see something very similar in the Detroit River. Um, again, if you look in the PFOS column, you can see um, what fish have been uh, tested for um, PFOS. And you can see that those Michigan servings per month category are not um, the driving, um, they're, they're not driving the current consumption guidelines that we have. Um, instead, um, those, are, those are driven by PCBs, dioxins, and or mercury. Um, and then just to um, explain some of these um, values, the limited um, Michigan, ser or Michigan servings per month category um, is, oh, sorry. The, the limited category is um, specific to individuals that are under the age of 15. Um, those individuals that may have um, health problems like liver disease or cancer and for women who are planning on having children or who are currently pregnant or breastfeeding, we recommend that they don't um, consume fish that are in this limited category. And then um, you'll see there's a couple of fish species that have a 0 0.5 um, Michigan servings per month. And what that means is it's actually six Michigan servings per year. So, that, so that's why it looks like it's a half serving because it's not based on month, it's per year. Um, and then the, the overall message of this table and the table before it from the Lower Rouge is basically to show that we are testing fish from these rivers for PFOS and other PFAS, um, but it's really the legacy contaminants that are driving the advisories. Next slide. Um, so the Eat Safe Fish program um, does a lot of outreach work in the Metro Detroit area. Um, specifically to the Detroit River, we have the Detroit River Walker program, which um, began in 2010. And basically these um, river walkers um, go along the shoreline of the Detroit River to talk to um, shoreline anglers and the general public about the Eat Safe Fish guidelines and some of the information um, that was in that table that I just showed. So in 2019 alone, um, they visited 23 fishing sites along the Detroit River. They interacted with over 800 anglers and they distributed over 700 of our Eat Safe Fish brochures. Next slide. In addition to the River Walker program, uh, the Eat Safe Fish program also works with a lot of um, Metro Detroit nonprofit agencies, um, and not just in Metro Detroit, we, we partner with um, different local organizations across the state. 
Um, and basically some of the different outreach activities that they do include giving presentations on the Eat Safe Fish program to different local organizations. Um, they participate in outreach events. You can find us, um, well, pre-COVID, you could find us at a lot of outreach events. We always had a booth. Um, and then we also post signs about these um, fish consumption guidelines. We currently um, have signs along the Rouge and Detroit River um, that have information about the fish consumption guidelines. And then for more information about anything that I've talked about, please visit the michigan.gov slash eat safe fish website. All right, it's back to you, Tracy. My apologies for that delay. I was, uh, well, we'll just leave it at technical trouble. Okay. Unable to unmute and uh, turn my video back on there for a second. So, all right, thanks for your patience. So I'm gonna sort of round out this uh, water discussion with some information about our surface water investigations. And so um, our water resources division in Eagle, some of their function is to do what we call ambient water sampling, right? So we just go out and we sample surface water bodies across the state to understand, to, to you know, collect baseline environmental data and to see changes over time. And so they've actually been sampling surface waters for PFAS for a number of years. And they've actually started recently to sample uh, some surface water foam when in communities or water bodies where we, we think we have a foam issue. Um, and the other thing they do is they sample what we call point source discharges, or what I think of as just you know industrial discharges to the river. Um, these are discharges that happen under discharge permits that have you know strict compliance monitoring associated with them. But but our staff also go out and sample those on occasion as well. So this map shows some of the sampling that has been done in the Rouge River watershed. Um, let's see if I can get that. Let me get that pointer back for a second. Okay. So we did some sampling in, in the lower rouge here. And when we think about PFAS in surface water bodies, again, it's PFOS that tends to be the driver. This has the lowest water quality standard for a PFAS compound. Um, and so if we, if we have a PFAS issue in water, in surface water bodies, it's usually PFOS. Um, and the standard we would be comparing this to for the Rouge River would be 11. Uh, it would be 12 parts per trillion, and in the Detroit River, it would be 11 parts per trillion. And so what you can see in these surface water results is that we are getting low-level detections in the low single digits, you know, sort of ranging from, you know, one to two parts per trillion up to six parts per trillion. And again, for reference, you know, your Rouge manufacturing complex is up here, Marathon is down here, you know, and this is, this is Zug Island and where the Rouge enters the Detroit River. And so what we're finding in the Rouge River is that the, the water in the river is below our water quality standards for, uh, for PFAS, and that is the same in the Detroit River as well. So I think this is our data point in the Detroit River, and we have you know, PFAS around one or two parts per trillion. This map is a, has a, a lot to look at. So if you just focus your eyes for a second, you'll see all these little dots along the, along the shoreline here. And each one of these dots represents a discharge from an industrial facility that was sampled and analyzed for PFAS. And so, um, you know, what you have here is Zug Island, and then this is the rest of the U.S. steel operation. And each one of these spots is a permitted outfall. And our staff went out and sampled these spots. Um, let me correct that for a second. It's the blue dots are, are U.S. steel. These white, this white dot here is the Great Lakes Water Authority. This is the discharge from the um, the wastewater treatment plant. Um, but what you'll see again, we are, we'd be comparing this to a standard of you know 12 parts per trillion. And for US steel, we had this one detection here of 32 that was above the water quality standard and they have since plugged that outfall in response. The Great Lakes Water Authority, they sample this outfall regularly. Um, I believe it was quarterly. And the most recent result we have is 15, but we have, we have more data for that point. Uh, if you move upstream here into the Rouge, we have sampling throughout what I think of as the Rouge Manufacturing Complex, which you know includes uh, you know Ford Rouge, AK Steel, Dearborn Industrial Generation, Double Eagle, 
they all you know have sort of an intermingled water system here of outfalls. Um, but again, everything is well below water quality standards. And so this was sampling that was done um, in response to that detection that we got in the city of Wyandotte back in August of 19, right? When we saw that blip of that you know elevated level of PFAS in a water intake, we went and we looked at every source, every potential source of PFAS upstream. And there really wasn't, you know, this did not bring us to any sort of smoking gun. We, we were not able to explain that, that detection and that water system based on any of this sampling that was done here. But it is, I think, you know, it's, it's good data to have and shows that, you know, these, these discharges are not contributing PFAS to, to the watershed um, above any kind of water quality standard. So now I'm going to transition a little bit and talk about some of our, um, our regulatory programs and how we're addressing PFAS through those programs. And so still on the, the surface water theme, I want to talk about uh, municipal wastewater treatment plants and a program we have called the Industrial Pretreatment Program. This is a program under the Clean Water Act that requires a municipal wastewater treatment plant to control any discharges of industrial waste that come into its system. So just like you, know, you saw on that last map, all those industrial facilities have a discharge directly to the river, many of those industries also have a discharge into the sewer system, right? That would go to the Great Lakes Water Authority for treatment before it comes out of, comes out of their outfall and into the river. And these industries largely also have you know, treatment of their own to treat that waste before it goes into the sewer. And, we, and all that happens under our industrial pretreatment program, or what you might sometimes hear is the IPP program. I will try not to use uh, an acronym there. But what we asked of our municipal water wastewater treatment plants is we said, you know, if you have industrial users and discharging industrial waste to your sewer system, we want you to go out and look for sources of PFAS. And so the Great Lakes Water Authority evaluated over 150 industrial users, and they found 43 sources. Um, and, you know, sort of generally speaking across their collection system, which is not just Detroit and Dearborn, I mean, it goes all across the, the Southeast Michigan region. You know, landfills, centralized waste treaters, metal finishers like chrome platers, um, these were our sort of, you know, biggest sources of PFAS that were found into our, into our um, wastewater treatment plant. The Great Lakes Water Authority is working with those facilities. Nine of them have installed treatment. Um, they have seven more facilities evaluating treatment, and all of these facilities have to develop and implement a best management program to reduce and eliminate control sources of PFAS into their system. And then our oversight of the Great Lakes Water Authority requires that that wastewater treatment plant monitor their effluent quarterly. You know, their effluent is their discharge into the river. They have to monitor that quarterly, and they have to have a source reduction plan. So transitioning to groundwater contamination. So across the state, um, we have, I think we're at about, a, I'm going to get that exact number wrong. It's over 100. This map is out of date already. Um, but we, we identify something as a site of groundwater contamination if we have groundwater data above our cleanup standard. And our cleanup standard was previously 70 parts per trillion if you combined PFOS and PFOA. And so if you have groundwater above those numbers, we said you are officially a, an MPART site, right? A site of, of groundwater contamination. When we developed those drinking water rules and we, uh, we got drinking water numbers for PFS, PFOS and PFOA, that automatically brought our cleanup number for those two compounds down as well. So now we have a standard of eight parts per trillion PFOA and 16 parts per trillion PFOS. And so when that number, those new numbers took effect, we had, uh, we had many sites that were, that had groundwater contamination above those new numbers that were previously under 70. So we had these sort of middle bucket sites. And so in August of 2020, our universe expanded from 99 to 138 sites. And again, you know, we're prioritizing all these investigations based on um, known or uh, based on routes of exposure. So like we talked about before, we're, you know, we're really lucky here in Southeast Michigan that we're using Great Lakes water as our source of drinking water. It's not particularly vulnerable to environmental contamination. So there's a much different scenario in places where you have people drinking uh, groundwater out of private residential wells, right? So here we have a system that's easily monitored and um, does not have a lot of uh, 
a lot of vulnerability to environmental contamination. But I'd like to highlight a couple of the sites we do have locally, um, just so you understand what we're doing in terms of environmental investigations. And so the first site I'm going to talk about is the Rouge Manufacturing Complex. Um, this is a combination of the, the Ford plant and AK Steel, you know, what was historically all, you know, the, the, Rouge, the Rouge plant, right? And we have divided this site up into two chunks. This chunk here in red is the Schaefer Road wastewater treatment plant. So these lagoons are where the, where the industrial waste goes from, from AK Steel before it gets treated and goes out into the river. And then this larger orange outline is what we call the, the Rouge Manufacturing Complex, sort of the, the, main, the main complex. And what we're looking at at the Rouge plant is legacy contamination, right? There's not a specific source that we have identified of a, of a specific industrial process or fire, you know, fire training or anything like that. Um, so it's just legacy contamination. It's over both our old groundwater criteria and our new groundwater criteria, right? So this would have been a site even if we had not changed that groundwater cleanup number. But again, everyone in the area is served by public water from the Great Lakes Water Authority. Um, so when we think about the Rouge complex, what we're, what we're concerned about are their discharges directly into the Rouge River, which we talked about have all been sampled and are under water quality standards. They're discharged to the Great Lakes Water Authority under their industrial pretreatment program. And the Great Lakes Water Authority is you know, evaluating with, and you know, working with them to reduce those discharges. And then that contaminated groundwater that's on site um, you know, given the location of this facility, that contaminated groundwater can vent or sort of seep out, you know, into the river or into storm sewers that lead to the river. So that, that venting of contaminated groundwater is really the path we're, we're most concerned with. So this facility operates under our hazardous waste corrective action program. And we've, under that program, we've requested additional investigation to to better understand the, the nature and extent of that contamination. And Ford and AK Steel are the responsible parties here and they're working on a corrective measure study. Um, and then our staff will be out in the river collecting additional samples um, later this month. So the next site I wanna talk about is Marathon Petroleum. It's the, you know, the refinery there. Now this investigation began um, when we had this complaint of the foaming sewer on Schaefer Highway, which is what you see in that picture. This was a really unusual event. Um, a manhole on the side of the road, you know, this, this white foam was sort of bubbling up out of the manhole and flowing down onto the road, where then it enters another storm drain. Now that storm drain down on Schaefer leads right back into Great Lakes Water Authority's combined sewer system. So that's not heading out to the river. It goes right back into the sewer and goes back to the Great Lakes Water Authority. But obviously, it's a really unusual condition that prompted, prompted an, an investigation. And so what we found is that you know, upstream of this sewer, there's many industrial facilities. Um, and one of the facilities that is tributary to that area is the Marathon Refinery. And given their industrial operation, you know, it was likely that they were a contributor of PFAS to, to that storm sewer. And at the same time, the Great Lakes Water Authority was assessing you know, their, dis their, their normal discharge into that system, and they had some data on, on that discharge as well. And so what we have found at Marathon is that they do have, you know, um, PFAS contamination in the ground, uh, but again, that entire area is served by municipal drinking water, and nobody is, is drinking that groundwater. So just to talk through some of what's been done on that site. Okay, so originally Great Lakes Water Authority issued a violation notice for the, the discharge that comes from their process into, their, into the municipal uh, sewer system. And then our department, Engel, required a groundwater investigation. So the initial investigation came in in July of 2019. And what they identified was that there are really five sources of PFAS contamination across the site. And this is coming from you know, historic fire training or emergency response. So like we talked about at the top of the presentation, you know, one of the most significant sources of PFAS contamination in the state is firefighting foam, right? Or that AFFF. Um, and so a place like a refinery where they, have, uh, where they have oil tanks, right? They have to train with firefighting foam to be prepared for emergency response. And so Dating back to the 1980s, Marathon has been conducting fire training. They have a fire training area 
Um, and so that's one of the most significant areas of groundwater contamination at the site, in addition to uh, two areas where there were historic spills or fires. And what we're seeing is, you know, a range of values, the, the highest concentration of PFOS we've seen in the groundwater there is 765,000 parts per trillion. And those are the kinds of levels you'll see when we're talking about, you know, AFFF and firefighting foam being used on a property, you know, for such a, a long period of time. Now, in response to all of this, Marathon has uh, stopped using PFAS foam for training, right? So it was, it was typical prior that fire agencies would use this foam in their training exercises so they'd be ready when the real thing came. So there's no more using PFAS foam in training. You know, they've, they've gone through and done some housekeeping things like blocked drains in case of spills. Um, they're required to sample their discharge to GLWA monthly. And they've also submitted another work plan to us to, to do some additional soil and groundwater investigation. And we should have a, more results by the end of this, this calendar year for some additional soil and groundwater sampling that's been done out there. Um, and then once those results are in, uh, you know, Marathon will have to develop some options to address that contamination. Part of that evaluation is that they're looking at, you know, the receptors. Is this stuff, you know, venting or migrating off of their site? You know, what are the potential pathways for this contamination to, to, uh, to move, right? And then they're also evaluating wastewater treatment options for uh, their discharge to the Great Lakes Water Authority. So that just highlights two facilities that, um, that are in this area that have known PFAS contamination. The other piece of this is prevention and accountability. And so, you know, one of the things we're doing through MPART is looking at how do we prevent future contamination. Um, and so what we found is that a lot of fire agencies had this AFFF foam that contained PFAS and they didn't really need it, right? And so we, we hosted a collection program where the state of Michigan um, hired a contractor to go around and collect a triple F foam that fire agencies no longer needed um, and to make sure that that material is safely disposed of, right? Because, you know, this material sits in storerooms, it could be improperly disposed, it could be used for training activities, it could be used on, you know, an emergency response where it wasn't needed. So we offered out to every fire training organization in the state. Um, they reported back what they had and what they wanted to get rid of, and we went around and, and collected it all. So to date, we've collected over 51,000 gallons of AFFF foam. Um, that material is collected and shipped in the containers that we get it in out to a, to a, to a landfill in Idaho, right? This is a hazardous waste landfill that operates in really arid conditions. Um, we talked at the beginning of this presentation about how difficult it is to destroy PFAS. And so um, what we're doing here really is sequestering it in this landfill in an area that doesn't generate additional leaching, right? So this material is not being disposed of in Michigan. It's not being put into the sewer. It's not being treated here in Michigan. It's collected and it's packaged up and it is shipped to a dry landfill in Idaho. There's also been some additional uh, legislation regarding the use of AFFF. And so, you know, these fire agencies can no longer train with the foam. And if they do have to put out a hydrocarbon fire with this foam, they, they have to report that to the environmental agency so we can start responding and evaluating any potential risk from that emergency response. Um, the last part of that I wanna to touch on in term is, is really the accountability piece. And, and some of you may be familiar with this, but the Attorney General's Office has filed uh, complaints you know, or lawsuits against manufacturers of AFFF to hold them accountable for damages to Michigan's natural resources. Um, and so again, you know, the MPART process here is, is really multi-pronged. It's identifying, you know, where there's contamination, it's making sure our, our public water supplies are safe, it's growing the science, but it's also holding, you know, the responsible entities responsible. So I guess it sort of gets to our takeaways, right? So just to, to hit back on that, you know, our very first priority is, is public health. And so that's why we do, you know, statewide surveys and have developed drinking water standards for PFAS. Um, all of those samples, all of those water supplies have been sampled and will continue to be sampled. And again, you know, the MPART program is really about, you know, partnership and working with all the agencies so that we can leverage all the resources of these different agencies. And then what we also have is a, is a big PFAS website. So this is michigan.gov slash PFAS response. 
And on this website, you can find all of the drinking water data. You can look at all the information we have about any individual site of contamination. That will be under a, a title, it's, it's a PFAS sites. You can find their pending investigations, information about um, AFFF collection and you know, all of the information we have about uh, biosolids research and everything is on this, this website. And for each individual site we talked about, like for Rouge or Marathon, they have their own page. And we recently translated those pages for the Rouge Complex and Marathon into Spanish and Arabic uh, to better serve that community. And as new information becomes available on these facilities or on any of these areas, that, that website is kept up to date. So if, you know, if you're wondering, you know, about the results of a, of a particular study or more drinking water sampling down the road, that's a place that you can go to, to learn more about that. So at that time, I think I have talked well enough. Um, I'm going to turn this back over to Jen to moderate some question and answers. Maybe. Thanks a lot, Trace. I appreciate it. I, yeah. I really appreciate you and Lisa spending the time to educate us this evening. I learned a lot. Um, uh, just uh, before we get into the Q&A session here, just to kind of build off of what Tracy was saying about the website, we did share a, a bunch of different links of information in the chat. So if you are, the chat is different than the question and answer, just so that you know, I know that can be sometimes confusing, but a lot of the websites that they mentioned today, we did share in there. So if you're able to grab those out, you can go ahead and do that. Um, we will also be sending a follow-up once this uh, video is posted and closed captioned, we will be sending a link out to everyone who attended this meeting with that information. We'll send links with those specific sites for Marathon and Rouge. So if you have um, people in your circle that are um, English as a second language or may benefit from the Spanish or Arabic translations, um, we hope that you'll share those forward. We would really appreciate that. So we do have some questions in the question box already, so that's awesome. Um, but just to remind folks, if you want to type your question in, that would be great. Go ahead and do that. If you want to raise your hand, you just click that raise hand icon on the bottom of the screen and we will go ahead and unmute you. We do definitely have some folks that are calling in. So if you want to um, talk and speak out loud, we can unmute you there as well. So if you click star nine on your phone, that will raise your hand for us. So we'll be able to see they have your hand up. So. I know Ms. Landrum, you have been sending in a bunch of questions to me. So I, what I'm going to do is just let you ask a couple of those if you don't mind. I know you had asked a question about, um, or asked if Tracy could go over again, those levels for the Rouge and Detroit River. And um, so if I'm gonna go ahead and let you talk there. And if you wanna go ahead and ask those questions, go right ahead. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jennifer. Um, I just, before I start, I wanted to ask the question. Tracy mentioned several times that the PFAS and PFOs are hard to get rid of. And we know they're bonded, so they're tight, so they're hard to break down. And she did mention the foaming on Schaefer that uh, it was dispelled into the Great Lakes Water Authority's uh, sewer system, and so it went into the facility. So when it went there, are you telling us that they successful, successfully removed the heavy concentration of PFAS out of the drinking water through the Detroit Wastewater and Sewage Department. Yeah, so let me just make sure I'm, I'm off mute, right, Ms. Landrum? Yeah. Um, so again, that what what we the situation we had there was a manhole on the side of the road, so that was coming out of the sanitary sewer system, or what in that area is a combined sanitary and storm sewer system, came out of the manhole out onto the road and back into that same system, which you're right, leads down to the wastewater treatment plant. And so this, think about it this way, if it had not come out on the road, you know, we wouldn't have seen it, but that, that same concentration was moving, to, you know, to that same storm, that same sewer system. I think it may have taken a slightly different path, depending on how those sewers are interconnected there, but it's all getting to the same place, which is the wastewater treatment plant. And that wastewater treatment plant does not specifically have any treatment uh, installed for PFAS removal specifically. And so what we're seeing there is, um, you know, the wastewater treatment plant manages about 500 million gallons a day of, during dry weather, right? Um, much more than that during wet weather. So that, that foam and those discharges will make their way to the wastewater treatment plant where it's mixed with all the rest of that water 
and then goes out of their outfall. There's not specifically treatment at that wastewater treatment plant for PFAS. And so what we have, what we've decided, the approach we've decided to take is that, you know, it would be, you know, I don't want to say impossible, but to treat 500 million gallons a day for PFAS would, would not be the, the practical approach, right? Because when you sample at the outfall for PFAS, you, you know, we're finding levels like 15 parts per trillion, right? So what's really more effective is to go up into the collection system and ask the users, you know, require the users of that collection system to address it at the source, right? Before it gets diluted, right? So if we just let that go into the, into the system, it gets diluted with all the other water, you can't really capture it, right? So that's why the Great Lakes Water Authority has asked Marathon to install treatment. That's why, you know, the other users of the system where they have found PFAS are being expected to either substitute out products so that the, the, the discharge stops or install treatments so they can address it at the source. Um, that didn't answer the question. The question okay. was, did PFAS go into our drinking water? If they cannot remove it, then that means PFAS was able to get into our drinking water source. Am I correct? It went into the source for the drinking water, right? So that, that, that foam goes through the wastewater treatment plant and out into the Detroit River. And then the water plants intake off of the Detroit River and treat the water. And so if you go back to the, the sampling we talked about in the beginning, right, and the concentrations that we were seeing at the water plants are largely non-detect. So you're not seeing it, you're not able to detect it, which is, you know, largely a function of dilution, right, because of the size of the Detroit River, the size of the, you know, the amount of water that's coming out of the wastewater treatment plant, you can't see it, right, you can no longer detect it, but certainly, if it was in that sewer, it came out, you know, the, the individual, you know, molecules, right, if you're talking about it from a mass balance perspective, so that discharge did come out into the Detroit River, um, but what you're... Therefore, you know, into the drinking water source. And when you said earlier, when you said earlier that it bonds and it builds up, so that means even though it was diluted, the bonding that we're drinking the water, you may not be able to detect it, but it's a chance that PFAS, we're drinking PFAS and it can build up over time. My question is how long has the, has Eagle known about the possible dangers of PFAS and PFAS and PFOS being in our water? Because if it's been years, we can have years of buildup of PFAS and PFOS in the, into our bodies. Okay, so, Madam, let's let to, Tracy oh, answer okay. that a second. And I, I think, um, what we might want to go back to, Tracy, is the part where you were talking about the testing that we do at the drinking water plants, mm -hmm. you know, where that happens. And give, if you can give a little bit more perspective on that. First, I don't know if we know a certain date when we started finding out about these possible dangers. Um, I think certainly we've seen some other things across the state um, for, with Wolverine and things like that. So I don't know if you can answer that question specifically or not, but maybe just address that uh, drinking water issue a little bit. And then I did want to get on to some other uh, questions that we had as well. Yeah, so um, I, let me go back to the drinking water piece. Um, and I don't know if it'd be helpful to bring those slides back, but I think I can summarize it, right? I mean, what we, what we did was we sampled both the drinking water intake, which is the raw water coming out of the river, and then the water after it goes through the treatment. Um, and we, what we largely saw was that you, you know, the concentrations of PFAS cannot be detected there, right? They're so low that they cannot be detected. But back to your concern about bioaccumulation, right? That's why we're looking at fish. That's why we're monitoring the discharges because we recognize that this, this can build up. Now, I don't know if maybe Lisa wants to say more about this, but it also points you back to the, if you remember the chart that she presented that showed how, you know, levels of PFAS in our blood, you know, we, we all, you know, most of us have PFAS in our blood and that has come down sharply, especially for PFOS since 2000 when these products were phased out. And so, you know, what we're really seeing is we're much more aware of it now and we're sampling for it now, um, but our, our, our exposures to it historically were much higher than they are now. I don't know if Lisa wants to say anything more about yeah, that. that actually, maybe Steve that actually talk to the history piece. Yeah, that fits in nicely. And I just want to make sure my other panelists, if you guys could turn your videos on, and I apologize, I didn't prompt you for that. Um, but we did have a question that 
was exactly about that. It said, what levels of PFAS and PFOS were found in the fish tested? So Lisa, I don't know if you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, and I just want to touch on the last question. Um, so PFAS is something that builds up in your body, you know, over time. Um, we are concerned about chronic or long-term exposure and less so about acute or short-term exposure. Um, so like Tracy said, you know, there was that one unusual detection of PFAS in the Wyandotte intake, um, but it was, it was just that one detection. Every other time that Wyandotte's intake has been tested, it's been non-detect. Um, so we're, you know, we are concerned about whether that, that is a trend. Um, so far, it doesn't look like it is. So we're more concerned about that, you know, repeated chronic long-term exposure versus, you know, a short-term exposure. So I just wanted to add that. Um, and then as far as the, the PFOS levels that were found in fish, um, I actually wrote that down. So for the, the two fish species that we have information for, for the lower rouge, um, PFOS levels range from 5.3 to 20.3 parts per billion. Um, and then for the Detroit River, um, we have information for um, three species and PFOS levels range from 9.6 to 44.1 parts per billion. So that just kind of gives you an idea of um, the levels that were found. And um, to put that in perspective, um, so it looks like, you know, the maximum level that was found was around 45 um, parts per billion. And we don't issue a do not eat fish guideline um, until it gets above 300 parts per billion. So just to kind of put that in perspective, um, you know, those numbers still put it in a Michigan servings per month um, category, but it's not a, a super restrictive, you know, do not eat fish advisory level. Okay, thanks a lot, Lisa. So I'm going to go um, back to our um, audience again. And Ms. Lukman, we have, uh, you have your hand raised, so I'm going to go ahead and allow you to ask your question. So you should be able to go ahead. Yes, I thought I unmuted you. Maybe you put your hand down. <laughs> If you did want to ask a question, go ahead and put your hand back up. There we go. Let's see. Uh, no, nope, I think she put her hand down. So um, here's a question. The question is, does Eagle expect wastewater treatment facilities to incorporate specific effluent limits into industrial pretreatment permits? I would just so start that question to Ann Cavalier if she can. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Tracy. And do you have an answer for that question? And I can read it again for you if you need me to. No, yeah. I, so I handle the initial pretreatment program in Southeast Michigan. So wastewater treatment plants are required to develop what we call local limits. So it's like an effluent limit for their industrial users. And so I'm going to speak about Detroit in particularly. They are actively working right now to collect the data and collect samples to develop a local limit for PFOS and PFOA that they then will input into their industrial user permits. And so we are pushing uh, and strongly recommending all these wastewater treatment plants that do have an industrial pretreatment program to develop a local limit for PFOS and PFOA that they can input into industrial user permits. Okay, hey, thank you. All right, so we have another question here, and I think this is going to go, Lisa, I'm going to direct this one to you, but if you can't answer this question, um, maybe you can let us know who can answer it. Um, but it says, can people who drink the water coming from the Detroit River be tested for PFAS, PFOS in their bodies at the expense of the polluters? If so, how do they arrange to be tested? So I don't know if we have any specific testing for this area for PFAS and PFOS and blood levels or anything like that. But, and if you don't know, I apologize, maybe you know who does know. No, I, I, can, I can tackle that. Um, as far as having like the um, responsible party pay for it, I wouldn't know about that. Um, you, you can have your blood tested for PFAS. Um, there are a couple caveats with that though. Um, the first is that most people do have um, some level of PFAS in their blood just because it's found in so many 
um, household and consumer products. So it's not unusual to find PFAS in your blood. Um, the other thing is a lot of doctors just aren't familiar with um, you know, testing for PFAS um, in blood. And then um, there's also some limitations on, on what that can tell you. So um, you, know, you can find out what the level of PFAS is in, in your blood compared to um, you know, what nationwide um, people have in their blood on average. Um, but it can't really tell you when your exposure to PFAS started or if it has caused or um, you know, will cause health effects um, down the line. So those are just kind of some of the, the caveats of, that comes along with blood testing. Thank you, appreciate that. So Ms. Lukman, I'm gonna try to unmute you again. We'll try this again. So I just did allow you to talk. So now yeah. you should be able to unmute yourself and you can feel free to go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, I do have um, two questions. One of them pertains to the Empart website. Um, the first being that, well, since we already know that over 700,000 parts per trillion were released in that one incident, why are, is our area not listed as an apart, as um, a PFAS contamination site and you have it as under investigation? Um, this is something that the entire area needs to know about. And when they go on there, it's a wild goose chase on trying to find out whether our area has PFAS contamination or not. Um, the second is more of a comment um, to kind of piggyback off what Teresa was saying. Eagle can test the soil and see how many how much PFAS contamination is contained within the soil. Um, that said, you should have a great idea of how much PFAS contamination has been done in an area, whether or not it's gone into the groundwater or not. Um, and my my question about that would be that included, you know, uh, uh, with PFAS contamination in the groundwater, is the fact that it can go into the air. And what is Eagle doing to try to mitigate that? So thank you. So if we can address the um, why is it not listed as a site in your area. So I know the Marathon and Rouge areas are listed as sites and I could be wrong, but Tracy nod your head if I'm correct on that. So Samra, could you, is there a place outside of that or, or where exactly are you kind of talking about so that we can make sure that we're addressing the appropriate place for you? So it was listed as um, an area under investigation okay. and not as an area of contamination. And this was as, as uh, re recently as about a month ago that I personally has gone in there and checked for it. So it's definitely not listed as a, as a full on contamination. It was listed under investigation. So Tracy, go ahead. Let me make sure I understand what the area we're talking about. Are you talking about the foaming sewer? Yeah, that's exactly okay. it. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure we knew, when we knew what what general area or, or specific area you were talking about. Um, so what we had at the foaming sewer was, uh, you know, obviously it came out of the manhole, ran down the embankment, onto the road, and into the sewer. That's not um, what we would consider a source of contamination, right? That would be an area, you know, potentially impacted by, right? So we have this this sewer area that's impacted by PFAS. And what we're looking for is what is the source of that PFAS? And so that's why we went upstream in that collection system. And we found, uh, you know, we found Marathon. We found a, a scrap yard that had had a fire. We're asking them to investigate the use of uh, a FFF foam uh, on that fire. Uh, but what we're trying to do is identify the sources of that and eliminate that from that sewer system. And so, um, you know, we don't, we don't classify sewer systems as, um, as MPART sites, right? It's, it's MPART sites are areas where there is a source of contamination, right? So that's why it's under area of investigation because it's sort of the, the catalyst for additional regional investigation, right? We knew we had an incident there that told us there's something going on in that sewer system and we have to go look for sources of it. And so that's what led us in you know, a sort of upstream on that. Um, you had a second question about testing the soil. Yep. Um, I'm not sure if maybe Steve Sliver wants to take any part of that question. You know, again, you know, our one thing I would emphasize, right, is our, our primary route of exposure and concern is ingestion. 
right? And so that's why it's the most important that we are testing the drinking water that people are consuming. We're testing the fish that people are consuming. So we can sample PFAS in the soil. We don't have uh, soil numbers, right, to compare that to um, and correlate that to, um, you know, any, any sort of transfer into the groundwater. So, so again, I think when you consider uh, risk or health hazard, you really want to focus in on what is it that we're ingesting. And so what we've seen in all of our water supplies over, you know, multiple months of testing is that, um, you know, that's well below standard or, or non-detect. And so we're not exceeding health-based numbers at the point of, at the point of ingestion. Uh, so Steve, did you want to add anything onto that? Just to make um, sure, because I know Tracy had thought to pass it over to you potentially. And just really briefly, I think, you know, Tracy, you know, you know, hit it all. The only thing that I would add to it is that we do have a, um, a soil survey plan for the state mm -hmm. to get a better idea of what we might expect to find throughout different types of soils and areas across the state. And try to develop a test method to determine how readily PFAS will leach out of those soils and into groundwater. Right now there is no recognized test method to do that and like Tracy pointed out we're in the early stages of evaluating that. We don't have criteria um, but, I mean, but that's a, a very valid point is you could test the soil. We're just not so sure what that would tell us. The primary pathway we're concerned about is the groundwater. Well, and, and I think that information will, oh, sorry, Steve, I, I was just going to say, I think that information will certainly be shared once we have it, and especially once we have a plan in, in place and things like that. Um, Ms. Lukeman, I know you still have your hand up, so I'm just going to, um, if you have another question, go I ahead. I do want to just really, really respond real quickly, as I want you to understand it from the perspective of a resident or a citizen that, um, for me, it's, it's not um, how much PFAS contamination compared to what is there now. I want it compared to what is healthy. And if there is an area of contamination or an area where 100,000 times the normal limit, the safe limit is released into my area, I want to see that on a website or I want MDHHS to, to send notification to me so that I am aware. And it's not just compared to what's there now. I want to know what is it. I'm in an area that's unsafe altogether. So um, that's just my response. Thank you very much. No, no, thank you for that. Greatly appreciated. Um, yeah, and Jen, if I could, if I could, yeah, go I ahead. want to make sure, um, you know, because I, I want to make sure we're, we're I, I understand the, the concern, absolutely. You know, and when we, when we talk about, okay, the, 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 the value we're comparing this to is eight or 16, and then we're getting results of 700,000. I know that that can, I mean, that, would, that should set off alarms, right? That should cause us to pay attention. Um, but what I want to bring this back to is the concept of exposure, right? Um, there is, you know, there are industrial hazards and industrial contaminants at these facilities, the Marathon and the Rouge Complex, right? There's contaminants in the ground, there's contaminants in the groundwater. What we have to think about is how are we being exposed to those contaminants? And so that's why, you know, the most important part of this whole evaluation is the safety of our drinking water system, right? And so we have contamination at the, at the marathon plant at, at high levels in the groundwater. Um, what we've done is, you know, we've sampled the river to see, you know, is it affecting the river? And the, the river is not exceeding water quality standards. We sampled the water supply and the water supply is not exceeding health-based criteria. And so the, the presence of the contamination at, at marathon does not necessarily quite directly to a, to a risk to people living in that immediate area. So I don't want anyone to come away thinking there's all this contamination at this facility and that, that equates to an immediate health hazard to the residents, right? You really have to think about that route of exposure. And so like we've talked about, when we do this work, we're really prioritizing this around um, drinking water systems that are impacted by PFAS contamination. And, and thankfully here in our Great Lakes water system, we're not seeing uh, levels of PFAS in that water that were, you know, that would be above any kind of health-based criteria. And that's very different than what you're seeing in other areas of the state where you have, you know, different kinds of soils. You know, if you look at the west side of the state, if you had, if you had a situation like Marathon in, in different geology, you had 765,000 parts per trillion in the groundwater and people around there drinking the groundwater as their source of, their source of drinking water, that would be a health hazard, right? 
but what we're seeing here is that our drinking water system is not being impacted by that contamination. So there's a really good follow-up to that, um, Tracy, if you can address this. The question was, was the soil that was impacted where the foam came out of the sewer cleaned up? Because I don't think we addressed that, and if we did, I might have missed it as well. So it's a really nice follow-up to that. I don't believe that it was, um, but uh, Joe DeGrazia is on the line. He is our incident manager. He would have better details as to how the HAZMAT team responded to that event. Yeah, Joe, do you want to address that for us? Yep, so the foam was erupting out of the sewer. It went down the embankment. It was a pretty steep embankment and then went into the street, which was covered in concrete. The path that it traveled down the embankment, that has not been dug up or remediated yet. Um, that will be part of the investigation for that whole area with the offsite sampling and the offsite migration pathway. So that will be addressed and we should be getting more information on that by the end of the year. So you said offsite migration pathway and I don't know what the heck you're talking about. I'm just gonna put that out there. So, <laughs> Can you plain language that for me, please? Yeah, any avenue that can, wherever a release occurs, how it can leave that area. So whether it's by groundwater, whether it's on, on top of the, the surface, like through surface water, um, all those different avenues will be investigated. Awesome, thank you for that, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, this question is a good one. Uh, so when did the Class B AFFF firefighting foam collection take place? And I was sitting and trying to rack my brain of a specific date, and Tracy, I don't know if you remember the specific date um, when we started that. Yeah. I, you know, Steve probably knows about the time. So I don't know when it started, but it was a, you know, it was a prolonged effort over the course of the year, right? And so the the number that we came up with, the over fifty thousand gallons, that's that was very recently, right? Um, so we've co been collecting this foam over the course of, I think it's the last year. Um, it hasn't honor, been like a super of, long amount of time. I mean, it hasn't been like over 10 years or something. No, it's been no, it's very recent, short period of time. very recent part of our, you know, part of our MPART strategy, right? And, you know, MPART was just formed in 2017, right? And so this is within the last calendar year, we've been collecting this, that we put out this contract and um, are collecting the AFFF foam out of communities. So ten this, oh, 10 months, thank ten you, months. Steve. See, we knew you would know, we knew you would know. It, it, I mean, I think we do kind of feel a little bit of sense of pride and that is a, a pretty big number of, of mm -hmm. to get out of potential contamination situations. So um, it's definitely something interesting to hear about and kind of have perspective that there was that much out there in the first place. Um, this is shifting gears a little bit. And the question is, are there any concerns in Southeast Michigan regarding PFAS contamination due to agricultural use of biosolids? Um, I wanna think about what we mean by Southeast Michigan, right? How okay. far is that? You can define it. I think <laughs> if, you, if you wanna define it as the kind of areas that we're talking yeah. about tonight, Detroit, you know, Airborne, Melbourne. I mean, Vail. certainly the, certainly the areas we're talking about tonight, we don't have, you know, agricultural lands, right? But as you get out more into, you know, maybe up in St. Clair County, um, you know, we do see biosolid applications. And so I don't know if maybe Ann Chavalier wants to tackle um, and tell us a little bit about the work that's being done to understand, um, you know, the, the pathway through biosolids. Just for anyone listening, you know, so we understand biosolids, we're talking about the sludge that comes out of wastewater treatment plants, right? So, Anne, do you have anything you can share with us about that? Yeah, so what I can share is that in 2018, the Water Resources Division conducted a statewide biosolid survey of 42 wastewater treatment plants in Michigan. And it was a, a mix of types of treatment plants, large, small, medium, and, and Detroit was one of them. So what we did is we sampled influent, effluent, and the biosolids at all four of these 42 plants. And then in addition, we selected a couple plants that do land apply their biosolids, and we did some soil and field sampling of these biosolids land application sites. And that summary report is available on the MPART page. It's under um, testing, and then if you go to the wastewater IPP page, 
you will see a link to that summary report. Now, it's just a summary report. We are working on getting a full technical report out by the end of the year. So these resources that we're talking about too, if, if folks are on the line that are interested in them, but you really can't find them, please just contact one of us because we don't want you to be sitting and spinning your wheels trying to find something that is evading you. Um, we did try to set that website up so it's fairly easy to use, much easier than some of our other ones, but it's still not perfect. So I don't have any other hands up or any other questions right now, and I want to give folks an opportunity if they have any to, to do that. You've had some great questions tonight. I always learn things on these, and like I mentioned before, I typically do air quality stuff, so always interesting to participate in these. Um, but before we go on here, I just want to share some information with you on contact information for folks that um, kind of deal with the certain different aspects of this. There was another site that um, is in this area to VASF that we didn't get to talk about specifically tonight, but if folks have questions about it, you can certainly contact Art as well. So again, we, we can share these slides with people if they're interested. We'll share a link that has the video on it as well as some of those other resources like the translated documents. And like I mentioned before, um, we know translation is sometimes uh, complicated and frustrating for people. So we really would encourage you to share those resources forward if you know someone who you feel might be interested in that. So that being said, um, I think I dilly-dallied quite a bit here. I try, I try really hard to talk slowly at the end and dilly-dally a little bit, um, but I really appreciate everybody taking the time tonight. I know you have a lot of other things you would probably rather be doing, and again, really appreciate the time you spent, and uh, please do let us know if you have any questions and look for information coming your way sometime soon. So have a great night, and if I can figure out how to end this thing, I will <laughs> actually do that. Thank you, right. everyone. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Thanks, all. Thank you.